giving a little bit of a break of the Church of Acts series until January, and we'll be starting a series then about the culture of the Church of Acts, and it's going to be one of the ones I have been waiting for. Um, I'm really excited about it. But we're going to be talking um, just for a couple weeks about uh, the power of his name. And uh, this is the season we get to celebrate Jesus. And so we want to delve just into something that we believe for this week and next week is really powerful, that if we get a revelation, it'll take us to a new level. How many of you want to go to a new level in our walk with God? So I believe, um, you know, sometimes we we can tend to tune out messages saying, oh, well, I've heard that. No, you know what? There are deeper levels for us to keep going into. Now, in the Bible, uh, Jesus was with his disciples, and... uh, he, he posed a very interesting question to his disciples. And really, that, that question is asked of us today. And it's in Matthew 16, 15. And it says, but you, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Now, these are people, these are disciples that he had walked with for three years. Right? And he says, who do you say that I am? And so all of us must answer this question. No matter how long we've known Jesus, whether it's been a moment, a day, we don't know him yet, or our entire life. Who is Jesus? And so we want to delve into this. So we, funny enough. We decided to ask Siri. How many people that think that's kind of... You know, yeah. it, it blows me away how many people use Google to develop their doctrine and yeah. their theology. But um, Listen to what Siri says. It says, Jesus, also, ref- um, also referred to as Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Christ, was a first century Jewish preacher and religious leader. Okay, so that's according to Siri. Wikipedia said basically the same thing. So he's a religious leader, a, a teacher. Uh, Britannica Dictionary said um, he was a religious leader revered in Christianity, one of the world's major religions. He's also regarded by most Christians as the incarnation of God. Okay, so it's getting a little bit closer. Uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary said he's the Jewish religious leader or teacher whose life, death, and resurrection as reported by the evangelists are the basis of the Christian message of salvation. So there are little aspects here, but, but interestingly enough, if you research most religions of the world will acknowledge that Jesus lived, right? Uh, Even history books can not deny that Jesus lived. There are too many prophetic things. There's too much historical fact um, that he lived. But where it comes to different, as you can see, even through these definitions of who exactly was Jesus, And that's where we want to know exactly who he is. Because here, these may say that he's a religious leader and a teacher, but the Bible says he is so much more than that, and that he is God himself. And so we want to delve into who he is so we can fully understand who he is. Because the name Jesus actually interprets meaning Savior. So that's more than a teacher. That's more than a leader. That's more than a good man or a prophet who walked the earth. This is the savior of the world that we need to understand exactly who he is. You so, know, Colossians 1, 15 to 20 says this. It says that he, that's talking about Jesus, is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir of all creation. For through the Son, everything was created both in the heavenly realm and on earth, all that is seen and all that is unseen, every seat of power, every realm of government, every principality and authority, it was all created through him and for his purpose. He existed before anything was made and now everything finds completion in him. He is the head of the body, which is the church, and since he is the beginning and the firstborn heir in resurrection, he is the most exalted one, holding first place in everything. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ, and by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and on earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. Wow, there's a lot to unpack in there. A lot. So we've broken down some points. You can find them in the notes section of your app so that you can go back through this. Because some of us need a deeper revelation and not a surface revelation of who Jesus really is. So point number one is this. 
He's the firstborn heir. Okay, so what does this mean? You know, it's, we hear this multiple times through, through the New Testament. He's the firstborn heir. Well, an heir is someone who inherits everything that a, that a father or mother has, right? And here it says he is the firstborn heir. And a firstborn, what I am so grateful for, means that there are more that can be born after. And you and I, when we come and accept Jesus Christ, he became the firstborn heir so that we can also be heirs of everything that Christ has, everything that God has. We are also heirs to it all. This should make you happy, guys. Yes. Okay. Okay. You know, inheriting all of Bill Gates' wealth is nothing compared to being heirs of the kingdom of heaven and all that God has. Come on. Amen. And Jesus made a way so that he could be the firstborn so that there could be, the Bible says he became a firstborn so that there could be many sons and daughters after him. And that is you and I, which is amazing. Number two, he created everything. Everybody say everything. Everything. Seen and unseen. See, what, we, what you don't understand is when, when, when everything starts, it starts in the unseen world, in the spirit world. And, and Jesus spoke, let there be light. There was no light. But when he spoke, let there be light, the power got released and all of a sudden light took off. Now, why is this important? Because everything, it says everything, it says everything was created by him. In other words, the whole way of, of, of how the kingdom of God operates was birthed through him. Right from the very beginning. You know, it wasn't one of those situations where God says, oh, that's just my kid. He's off doing his stuff, you know. Are you with me? It's just my son, you know, he's acting a little like a teenager. No. The Bible says that he was there right from the very beginning. He was there and he was, he was there when things were spoken into existence because he was part of that. So this is important for us to realize Jesus was never an afterthought. He was the thought. Amen. Amen. Number three. This is really interesting, especially in this season right now. All authority and government was created by him and for his purpose. This is really interesting because too many of us think government and God need to be separated. When in fact, government and structural authority was created for God's purposes to be accomplished. We can't separate the two. We need to be praying for government. We need to be praying for those in authority because it is set up by God, by Jesus. It says here, he created the system Right, he, the, the perfect system. Now, of course, sin has corrupted the whole thing. <laughs> but it is for his purpose, which is why we need to be praying for our government. We need to be praying and putting godly people into place. We need to understand that those systems are there not to be separate from God's plan on the earth, but, in, but to actually help accomplish God's plan on the earth. Number four, he is the head of the church. Let me say this again. He is the head of the church. Yeah. So when people ask us all the time, whose church is this? I said, it's the Lord's. We might be managing, but we do not own it. That's right. The body of Christ belongs to Christ. He's the one that died for them. He's the one that redeemed them. He's the one that pulled them out of a mess. That's us. <laughs> but we belong to him. Well, this is my church. No, it's not your church. You're managing it. It's his church. See, when you realize he's the head of it, now all of a sudden you realize that he's actually the one that's supposed to be in charge of what's going on. So we have to follow the godly precepts that are in scripture so that we follow exactly what he wants. See, when, when, when he's the head of something and you're in charge, if you're the head of your family, you're going to be the one that makes the decisions, good, bad, or indifferent. Do you know God's decision already has been made for the church, that the church live in blessing, that the church live in prosperity, that everything that heaven has already belongs to the church, that I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. God's already set the motion in place of how he wants his Amen. church to be, that thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. 
So he's already setting it up for us, but he's the head of it. He's in charge of it. He's the one that died for it. Amen. And that leads us to number five. He holds first place in everything. Say everything. 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 Now that means that on Monday morning, when you go to work, Jesus should still be in first place. Okay, that means when you're dealing with a family situation, Jesus should still be in first place. That means when you're trying to figure out a financial situation, Jesus should still be in first place. Too many of us are wondering why our lives are going sideways, but we've put Jesus into this little box over here that says Sunday mornings. Right? But here it says first place in everything. If we could get the fact that he's got to come first. In other words, when we go into our finances, we would say, what does Jesus say about my finances? You know, what does Jesus say about raising my kids? What does Jesus say about how I'm treating my neighbor? What does Jesus say? When we put him first place, it's amazing how things come because that is the way God put it. He put him in first place of everything. But many times we are not in alignment because we've kept him in a box to the side where God wants, to be, wants Jesus to be first place in everything. Number six, Christ holds the fullness of God within him. Now, I want you to get this revelation. All of who God is was displayed through Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when the disciples came to him and said, hey, we'd like to see the Father, his comment to to them was, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father Father already. In other words, the only part of God that became flesh and dwelt among us is Jesus. There's three parts of God. We know there's the Father, we know there's the Son, which is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit you can't see, and you can't see the the Father, because they're spirits. But Jesus became flesh. In other words, he says, this dysfunctional group is not going to figure it out. So he took himself out of glory, the king of glory, the great I am, the Alpha, the Omega, the one that spoke things into existence, put himself into an earth suit. He stripped himself of everything so that you and I could come along and say, hey, he's my buddy. Hey, high five. I get get what he's doing. But he was all of God. He wasn't an after effect. He was the fullness of who God was on the earth. Uh, And when he walked in operation, because a lot of people, when you get around them, they say, well, listen, and we're going to do this dinner thing, but just don't bring up the name of Jesus. I said, well, then don't bother praying. I mean, he's, uh, he's it. Are you with me? There is no side option. The side option is the devil. I'm not praying to the devil. If I can't pray in the name of Jesus, there's no point in praying. There ain't no power available anyways. You can't tap into it. So people say, well, well, sir, so as long as you can talk about God, but as long as you don't talk about Jesus. I said, well, he is God. What are you talking about? Come on, somebody. If you don't have Jesus, you got the devil. There's no options. It's option A or option B. They'll mask, the devil masks himself as all sorts of stuff, so he'll show up in all different things in different forms, but you either walk with Jesus and have his power, or you're on your own. Amen. Number seven, Jesus restored everything back to the original intent before the fall of man through sin. And I want you to see that in this scripture. I want you, if you could just put up that scripture again, Colossians 3, that last verse. And it says, and by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. Praise God, restored to innocence again. Maybe some of you need that, that man, I, I, I need to be restored back to innocence again. You know, back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God's perfect intent for humanity was destroyed. Because his intent was to walk in the garden, to have relationship, for us not to feel the sting of sin, not to have to feel the destruction that sin brings. He's not, he wasn't trying to limit them. He was trying to protect them. 
from sin because the wages of sin is death. But Jesus coming, what he did is he reset the, the whole system. And by, by being sinless and dying and taking our, our, our place, he reset it so that when we accept Jesus and when we live in Christ, we can now live the way God intended it for us to be in this perfect union with him where we get to walk in the blessing of God in, in this deep relationship. So, you know, we talk about this a lot, but there's two systems in the earth. There's the earth system that we all are automatically, by default, born into. That's what we see all around us. That's our, what our natural senses know, everything else. But then there's another system over here of the way God intended it, and that's the kingdom system, right? Where his provision is there, where there is peace, where there is a, a, you know, a community with Jesus, with, with the Father. There's intimacy. There's provision. There's relationship. That's the way he intended. And, and because of what Jesus did, it says he took us back to the innocence of that place where, where we're not destroyed by what the world is. You know, this year, um, we talked a lot about this. We taught a lot about this in Kenya when we were there. But this year, how, you know, I, trees and plants, and maybe some of you guys are gardeners. I am not. I kill everything that's living, you know, as far as plants go. But... But did COVID-19 this year affect the trees and the plants? Why not? Because they live in a different system. They operate in a different system. And so you and I don't operate in this earthly system. We operate in a different system called the kingdom of God system, which is the yeah. way God intended us to live. And in that system, it doesn't matter what happens in the world, we are blessed by God and we have a protection of God. And that's why the world may be panicked, but we can go, God's got me. When the enemy comes in and tries to destroy my year and 2020 take me down, you're going, I don't think so. God is going to take what the enemy meant for harm and he's going to turn it for my good and I'm going to come, come out on. stronger than I ever have. Come on. And that is all, all because Jesus came and reset it all back to the innocence of how God intended for us to have relationship yeah. with him. That's good. That is why it's so powerful we understand who he is. Listen to this in Hebrews 1, 1 to 4. It says, throughout our history, God has spoken to our ancestors by his prophets in many different ways. The revelation he gave them was only a fragment at a time building one truth upon another. But, everybody say but. But, but to us, say that's me. But to us living in these last days, God now speaks to us openly in the language of a son, the appointed heir, say that's me, of everything, for through him God created the panorama of all things and all time. Woo. Now I want you to see this because in the Old Testament they got a little nugget. Another drop. This is what this Messiah is going to look like. This is where he's going to come from. And it came through the prophets like b basically over thousands of years. And so when they, that, that's why they would have to sit down and try to figure it out. Is this the Messiah? Watch this. When Jesus showed up, he said, I got to help these people. They need help. So he's like took us by the hand and he says, let me just walk you to where you need to be. Let me give you some inside information. Let me tell you what the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of heaven is like. And he would constantly be showing us what it looks like. Because he knew we were missing it. See, the people were, were, were not stepping into what God had for them. They were missing it. Now, there's something about a son and an heir because we have four boys. And thankfully, two of them are married right now and to amazing women. And, and uh, I'm sure the next two, will, that something will come together as well. Praise the Lord. But, you know, my kids are my heirs. Do you know that everything I have belongs to them? Did you know that I've opened up things and I've told them stuff that I won't tell you? Because they're my heirs. They know where everything is. They know how everything operates. They run the businesses, basically. I just get to show up now. Are you with me? They're heirs. I said, they're not going to steal because they're stealing from themselves. Hello, people. 
When you know how much your father already set you up with Jesus that he's already given you, you'll say everything's going to be okay. See, that's when you walk through difficult times. How is this going to work out? You just know God's got me. It's going to be all right. I don't need to panic. Sons get inside information. Daughters get inside information. Amen. You're one of them. Amen. Listen, he's going to give you some inside information. Mm -hmm. Praise God that we don't live in the little nuggets anymore, but we live in the fullness of Jesus. Verse 3, the sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor, the exact expression of God's true nature, his mirror image. He holds the universe together and expands it by the mighty power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of sins and then took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the majestic one. Okay, so there's some more, there's a few more nuggets we're going to pull out of this one. <laughs> it's amazing how in this chapter there's so much wealth. But number eight is Jesus is the exact expression of God. Exact. Exact. Now in the, in the Old Testament, because there had been no no uh, penalty for sin paid. Jesus paid for all of our sins. So there was a wrath of God. There was, there was all of this sacrifice and there were all this, you know, anger and, and all this stuff because there had not been someone pay the price for the sin. But that's not who God's heart is. That's what had to happen in order to deal with sin. But Jesus now represents exactly what the God's nature is. And if, if we look at Jesus, we do not see him coming up and pointing judging fingers at you and me because we messed up. Right? What we see is a Jesus who went to a woman who was caught in adultery. She was guilty, people. She was guilty. And he went up and gave her mercy and grace and said, go and sin no more. When they wanted to stone her, he gave her grace. See, that's not a God who's waiting to get you. Because that represents the heart of what God wanted for us. He wanted to be, he doesn't want you scared of, oh, you know, I, I don't know if I could go to church because God might get me, you know? As, as he likes to say, he can get you at the Walmart parking lot if you wanted to, right? <laughs> but, but how he wants to get you is with his love. And he wants to romance you back to himself. He wants you to know the goodness of God. Amen. So, so understand that Jesus expressed the heart of the Father. When he went around healing, he said he healed all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. Right? That means God's heart is to heal everyone. We can be confident of that. Now, the only place he didn't heal was where people didn't believe in Jesus. They doubted him. Right? So, so understand that, that he perfectly expresses the Father. It's not Jesus is this compassionate, grace-filled one, and God is a judgmental one trying to get you. No. They are full of love and mercy. Now, number, number nine, nine says the power of his spoken word, it expands the universe. Mm -hmm. So how do we accept that? We have to speak his Access word. It. Now, next week, we're going to go into depth into this because this is mm -hmm. the key of where the breakthrough happens. But I can tell you, when you are understanding how his word works and you release it out of your mouth, it's like taking an arrow and, and the, the arrow is the word of God and every time it's released, it bullseye the target. Mm -hmm. Boom. Boom. See how powerful it is? We're going to get into it next week, so that's the hook to bring you back next week. <laughs> Number 10 is good news for all of us. He has completely cleansed our sins. Thank Praise God, for, God that. for that. Because you know what? The interesting thing is, if your sin was lying or if your sin was mass murder, it doesn't matter. He paid for it and it's cleansed. Completely cleansed. You know, when you stand, if you've asked him to forgive you and you are walking and living for Christ and he is living within you, do you know that when you stand before God someday, he does not count that sin against you? Because he has forgiven. It's an amazing thing because Jesus paid the penalty for it, which means we can stand before God. We can have right relationship with him. This is an amazing, amazing thing. You know, because of that, because he paid for our, our sin, it means that I, it doesn't matter what your past looked like. You know, I celebrate your story. Yeah, I know some of you come to me and you go, oh, I'm just so ashamed of my story because you don't know what I did. 
Now let me tell you, I celebrate it because all that does is give God all the more glory for how great his mercy and his grace are Amen. and how great what he did. Man, that is awesome. We celebrate because he has cleansed you from that. That may be your story, but it's not who you are. Amen? Amen. Now your story gets to be rewritten to see what God has to say about you, which is a beautiful, yeah. beautiful, amazing story. Now number 11 is really cool. It says he is seated above everything. Everybody Ooh. say above everything. Above everything. So if he was put, been put into the United States and given him a position, he would have been put in the Supreme Court and not just made one of the judges, he would have been the head judge. You can't get higher than that. Well, the thing is this, according to the whole universe, he is the head of the whole operation. There is no higher position to get than the position that Jesus holds. Now watch this in Ephesians 2, 6. It says, he raised us up with Christ, and exalt, the exalted one, and we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm, for we are now co-seated as one with Christ. You need to get your mind around that. I said he's in the highest office. There is no higher office, and you just got a seat beside him. See, sometimes we don't understand that. We do goofy stuff. I remember when we first had a child, Brett, and we brought him home from the hospital. I, I'm like, boy, this thing just makes noise. <laughs> what do we do? They didn't send me home with a video. I mean, uh, what, uh, come on, I'm doing one of these. Uh. I said, call your mother. Have her move in with us. She did. She came for two weeks. Here's the funny thing. When she showed up, this is what she said. Don't worry. Everything is going to be. Well, how come she knew that and I didn't know that? She already experienced it. She already was in that office before. Do you know when you have a perspective of seated in the highest office, when all hell breaks loose, you say, don't worry, this is going to be okay. This is just temporary. This is really not a big deal. I know that it looks like my marriage fell apart. It looks like this happened. My business tanked. Did this happen? Don't worry. It's all just temporary. See, you have a different perspective because if God before you, who could ever be against? You're already seated in that place. When we get that revelation, we go, my God, anything. come on, go ahead, make my day. <laughs> Nothing will rattle you. Well, didn't you know COVID-19 was coming in 2020? I said, I'm sure heaven's panicked. <laughs> come on, people. No, you've been given the authority over it. It's quiet in here. I step on some religious toes. <laughs> You have been given all that authority. Jesus, Amen. your big brother, seated you with him. He says, don't worry, I've already paid for it. I've already done everything that needed to be done. I was, when I said it was finished, I meant it. I said I took care of the bill in its entirety. Come sit with me. Amen. See, now you don't look at it of what is going to happen in my life, but you say, don't worry, I have the answers. I want you to look at this. This, this phrase is it right. That means that we are seated above everything. Because if we are seated with Christ, we are seated above everything. We live from a place of victory. We don't fight for a place of victory. That's good. Okay? We don't live, we live from a place of victory. We don't fight for a place of victory. Okay, this is where most Christians get it wrong. Most Christians, a, a problem comes, the enemy's coming at them, and all of a sudden they're like, oh God, please, you're up there, and I'm down here, and I need an answer. God, why aren't you hearing me? Why aren't you helping me? He goes, honey, you are already up here over all of that issue. It's about time you started acting like you were over that issue. It's about time you started not letting the wet devil wag you and you start wagging him a little bit. Come on. Instead of waking up, when you get a revelation of this, when you wake up in the morning, it's not like, oh, what's the devil going to do to me today? Instead, it's like, oh, what is the devil going to try and do to me today? Because <laughs> I am going to whip his butt. 
Because you see, you take on a different mentality when you understand the victory is already inside of you. And we, by faith, release it. We don't have to hope that God brings us the answer. The answer is in Jesus, and Jesus has to, is over everything, and he's inside of you. We operate from a place of victory. If there's nothing else you get as a revelation, you focus on that this week. I operate from a place of victory. I don't fight for a place of victory. So there's a question, are we living with the fullness of who he is and who he has been revealed as, or like the Old Testament, are we living with only a fragment or a revelation of him? See, if you don't know who you are and whose you are and where he's already placed you, you'll listen to the lies of the devil and you'll take a, a back seat. Well, it couldn't be for me. I just grew up this way. You don't understand. Nothing ever good happens to my life. And watch how you speak because the Bible says you have everything you say. So watch what you're saying. That's right. Just throw that for next week too. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there because we, we, we think we're already defeated. Mm-hmm. But what does the Bible say? Yeah. God says, give your, give your head a shake and see if there's something inside. Yeah. <laughs> What are you talking about? Jesus already paid for it. Amen. See, we have, we have to understand that God has not changed. So if we're not seeing God moving around, we are the ones who have limited him by the revelation that we have or do not have. Too many of us are living with a little tidbit of information about what, who Jesus is instead of the fullness. Colossians 3, 1 to 4. We're going to go through these. It says, Christ's resurrection is your resurrection too. This is why we are to yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of power, honor, and authority. This is such good news, people. Such good people. Did you see this? Uh, Now, look at this. His resurrection is your resurrection too. His victory is means your victory is already accomplished. That's good. Your victory is already accomplished when we live in Jesus Christ. Too many of us are acting like our victory isn't there. Man, you should be celebrating. Whatever that issue is you're going through this week, you should be leaving here going, praise God, the victory is mine. But you see, we have to activate these things by faith and by the revelation. Once you have a revelation of what God does for you and who he is and what is already inside of you, now you'll rest. Now it's like, I guess I don't have to strive anymore. I can rest in God. I can trust him because I know it's already done. He's already got me. Listen to verse 2. Yes, feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm. Let me just say that. Feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill your thoughts with heavenly realities and not with the distractions of the natural world. I want you to get this understanding. Mm -hmm. How many of you have had teenagers at home? When you say feast, what happens? There's a swirl. I mean, you look, bam, I thought I just went grocery shopping. Everything is gone. And they're asking you what's to eat. Is it true? God said he wants you to feast on everything heaven has. See, if you and I don't feast, don't get mad at God later. Because when you get to heaven, say, oh, my life. Uh, oh, ouch. Him, uh, uh, and he'll say, I told you to feast. It's quiet in here. <laughs> he told you to feast. See, sometimes when I talk to people about God's blessing, they have a hard time receiving it. So I usually try to offend them. I said, if you don't want that blessing, it's okay if I have it. Come on. You already have enough. No, not according to God. Be fruitful and multiply. That's what he told me to do. I'm just doing what he told me to do. Did you just hear what I said? He said, be fruitful and feast. I came to bring you life and more abundantly. Here's the church. Well, I don't think I'm a t- I don't think that belongs to me. I, I haven't, I haven't. Watch this. The devil's been stealing from me. You've been letting him do it. I want you to understand what feast means. It means that you're going in there like it belongs to you. Like you're a 16-year-old teenager that hasn't eaten for about two hours. (laughs) 
You tear the cupboards open. What's to eat? See, that's the same thing you and I have to ask God. Amen. What's to eat? Amen. See, God has everything for your life in its fullness. You and I have to yeah. tap into it. That's right. But if we don't, don't get mad at him. Look at this. All that heaven has is yours. Focus on that reality and not your current situation. Too many of us are focused on what's going on instead of what he has for us. Amen. Verse 3. I love this one. Your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. In other words, this, the, the world system no longer has a hold on you. It's been severed and you now get to live in God's kingdom system. That's a good thing. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, who you really are will also be revealed. For you are now one with him in his glory. Mm. I want to read this again. I want you to get this because there's something subtle but powerful here. As Christ himself is seen for who he really is. In other words, when we get a revelation of who he really is, not who a Sunday school teacher once again, once a long time ago taught us, or not a little, you know, pretty, you know, precious moments Jesus statue that we saw, anything like that. But when we see him for who he really is, who you really are will be revealed. If you've ever asked yourself, who am I? What's my purpose? Like, what have you got for me, God? I don't know who I am. I don't know. Like, what, what am I doing in this world? Too many people chase after the answer to that question. But here it says, if you chase after the answer of who is Jesus, you'll find who you really are. That's good. Because you see, when Jesus is inside of you, you're supposed to operate the way Jesus did. And you'll start, start suddenly understanding that you are above that situation. Okay, that you have got the healing power and the, the spirit of God inside of you to release answers into your situation. So if you need to know who you are, go back to who Jesus is. You know, um, to the degree that we have had the revelation of who Jesus really is, will determine how much of his power can be released within us and through us, okay? So here, if we are only getting our revelation of Jesus from a Sunday school teacher, from a Sunday morning service, from, you know, um, things we learned long time ago, we are gonna limit the power of God in our lives. We have got to be people that dig in and go, I want to know everything there is to know about Jesus. We, let me tell you, you'll never stop learning about more of him. Man, we've been in ministry for 13 years and we still are blown away when we go into the word of God and go, whoa. When did they add that in there? When did they add that? You know, the, the Bible in Revelation, it says the angels are circling the throne room of heaven going holy, holy, holy because they keep seeing new aspects of God. Man, you guys, we've got to realize, we've got to go deeper in our revelation. Search out who is Jesus. And the more you search out who he is, the more power will operate through your life. And we're going to talk a lot more about releasing his power next week. I want to end with this, Matthew 16, 13 to 17. When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples this question. What are the people saying about me, the son of man? And who do they believe I am? They answered, some are convinced you are John the Baptist and others say you are Elijah reincarnated or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked. Simon Peter spoke up and said, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are favored and privileged, Simeon, son of Jonah, for you didn't discover this on your own, but my Father in heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. So here, in order for us to have a full revelation of who Jesus is, we need, we need God. We need the Holy Spirit to reveal this. We need a supernatural impartation. That is why we, in our own logic and own theory, cannot figure Jesus out. We have to be in the word of God. We have to be in church where we're in the presence of God, where we're worshiping him, where we have, give ourselves that opportunity to be exposed more and more to who he is. Amen. We need to, to start seeking him in prayer, in relationship. And as we start doing that, his, God's supernatural ability comes in to reveal him. Have you ever wondered, you've met someone who doesn't know Jesus and they just 
don't get it. It doesn't matter what you say about God, they just don't get it, right? Because there is a supernatural understanding that only can come from God and His Holy Spirit that breaks off our blinders, that breaks through deception of the, the lies of the enemy and reveals them. So that's why it's so important that we chase after Him with everything in us and allow God to reveal. You know, I want to just close with this story here and then give you an opportunity to make sure that Jesus is the Lord of your life. But about 13 years ago, a really good friend of ours, he was a baby Christian. He really got on fire for God. I mean, God just showed up and started doing supernatural miracles in his life and his family's life. And then all of a sudden, somebody came along, a Christian brother, and started diluting the water. Well, you know, the Bible's not always accurate. There are some stories that contradict each other. And planted enough doubt that he turned around and says, I don't want any part of God. I've walked away. And I thought this knucklehead, this halfwit that just shot this baby in the back. Are you with me? I'm sorry, I get a little direct and to the point sometimes it offends you I'm sorry take it past my wife later I said you know the Bible says if we do anything to any of these babes it's best we have a millstone on around our neck and dropped into the ocean God takes it seriously when you mess with babies in the middle of this he walked away he had nothing to do with God put a lot of stress into his relationship with his wife and everything else. Everything was going downhill. But I kept in touch with him because I just told him, I said, God's not done with you. See, once you give your life to Jesus, he doesn't just bail out on you. He sticks with you. Even when we do stupid things, even when we reject them, even when we speak ill and do everything else. Well, I just, I just felt my spirit to call him yesterday and as I called him, he says, well, I got COVID-19. I said, well, that was good news. Come on, somebody. You're talking to the one that, uh, that has the authority to annihilate COVID-19 because I represent, I'm already seated with my, with my big brother, Jesus. So he's already given me that authority. That's no problem. Don't look at me funny. Look at yourself because you've got that same power. He says, my life's falling apart. I turned my back on God. I said, I know. I said, it's okay. God still loves you. He still has a plan for your life. It might have had a 13-year reset. Are you with me? But God's not done with you. It's no big deal. Yeah, but if you only knew the things that I did. I said, yeah, that's no problem either. I said, because when we come to him, he's still faithful and just to forgive us of our knucklehead moves. My marriage is not doing well right now. I said, well, that needs to be fixed too. Come on, somebody. See, you need to be the answer to the situations people are walking through. He says, I've walked away from him. I said, well, he hasn't retired, so I think you're going to be okay. It's okay to throw some humor in. I said, he still loves you. So I need to come back to him. I said, yes, you do. Come on, somebody. See, the Holy Ghost never let him go. I said, I'm going to pray for you. And as I prayed, he just started weeping on the phone. You don't understand. I said, no, but he's that big. It's no big deal. I said, he's in the restoration business. It's Christmas time actually too because this should be good. See, that same Jesus doesn't matter how you've lived your life, whether you're here or you're, there's some, there's people online you're watching right now and you've just said, I'm not sure about this. But yet your room is filled up with his presence. The same presence that's in this auditorium is in your room and you're thinking, well, this is kind of weird. In fact, some of you, the hairs on your arm are going up because you're like, what's going on here? That's God. He's getting your undivided attention. You need to surrender your life to him and get your life right. Just like my friend has got his life retooled with God, you need to do the same thing because you can't fight this fight on your own. You need Jesus to back you up. You need to put yourself into the high seats of being placed in those high seats beside God. So that when you walk, you'll have victory. I want to invite everybody to pray this prayer with me. So if you're here, say it out loud. If you're online, say it out loud. The prayer is so powerful, it'll change your life. It goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name, Father, in Jesus forgive name, me. Forgive Come into my life. Come into my life. Be, my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. 
and help me to live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.